Good morning. As Pastor Greg has already mentioned, we are beginning to open up the church for in-person worship service viewing starting on July 19th. I'm really excited about this. But on Wednesday, we sent everyone an email with an attached letter that provides the details so you can join in on the service. If you haven't had the chance to read it, I would really encourage you to do so. Often, when a person is being described positively, it is said that said of them that they are a strong and confident person. Well, what does that mean? A dictionary would describe confidence as having assurance or self-reliance or have, are being full of conviction. Why is it that we consider confidence to be a positive attribute? Well, the alternatives don't sound that great. The opposite would be a doubtful, fearful, uncertain, apprehensive, timid, and weak person. Like many things, confidence can be an asset and it can also be a liability. It is a liability when we have what we might call an over-actualized belief in our own ability. For instance, polling has shown that the United States ranks 25th in the world in math. But if you ask Americans, are you really good at math, they often will say yes. So what is really true is that the United States is ranked number one at thinking they are really good at math. Overconfidence or unreasonable confidence is really just pride not admitting what is true. Parents often teach their children that being confident is important. And one way we do this is to tell our children that they can do and be anything they want to be. Now, I completely understand why we do this. But if we take it too far, we are actually lying to our children. And depending on what we tell them, and if they are act upon it, we set them up for disaster. As an extreme example, I can tell my child she is amazing, and if she wants to be a professional hockey player, she can. Well, saying this to her is nearly a lie, and certainly it is setting her up for failure and disappointment. The truth is, is that if my aptitude for math is low, It would not be confidence building to tell me I can be a mathematician. If I can't sink a basketball, it would not be confidence building to tell me I can try out for the basketball team. As much as confidence can be a liability, it certainly can be an asset, but only in the right context. The confidence that every believer should have is almost almost an oxymoron. What I mean is that as you and I have less confidence in ourselves and more confidence in God, we begin to gain greater and greater confidence of who we are and what we should be doing. As Christians, our ability to be or do something should not be based upon the voices of approving cheerleaders, but upon the basis of God's Word. It is the Bible that tells us who we are and what we can be and what we should do. The truth is that having God confidence rather than self-confidence is the nature of the Christian life. Without it, we do not self-evaluate well, and we do not accept criticism, and we are certainly in danger of pride. Psalm 16 is a very interesting psalm. The psalm is attributed to David, but because it is quoted in Acts 2 and 13 in regards to Christ, it is often considered a messianic psalm. This psalm can be said to have two layers. One is the layer that conveys the deep expressions of a man in need of God. And the other is the layer that conveys hope of the coming Christ. This psalm is a very important psalm for our days as it shows us what it means to place our confidence or our trust in God. It is a psalm that speaks of what it really means to be committed to God and how that commitment ultimately is the much better source of our confidence than anything this world has to offer. We live in uncertain times. We have no clear understanding of our future despite our best laid plans and our dreams. This life, this culture, this world, this humanistic ideology cannot provide this confidence. And yet, our world blusters and brags without a single clue. This world likes to display a pseudo-confidence from little decisions like what kind of chewing gum to buy to big decisions that shut down an entire economy during an epidemic. And yet, if questions are asked regarding the rationale behind this confidence, we find a culture in search of meaning and a society that really has no answers. Much of this is tragic, but what compounds it is when those who claim to trust in the Lord believe the rhetoric of this world. 
When we as Christians emulate the world's bravado, when we buy what they are selling, when we put our trust and our hope in the system, we lean on a form of confidence that is nothing more than a posturing empty facade and a mask worn to disguise its true appearance. Psalm 16 shows us a better way. The psalm can be divided into three sections, with each of the sections broken down into two more sections. Section 1 from verses 1 to 4 outlines a confession of confidence and how that confession is lived out. Section 2 from verses 5 to 8 describe the cause for confidence. And section 3 from verses 9 to 11 conveys the commitment to confidence by way of several declarations. First, let's look at the confession of confidence in verses 1 to 4. David begins by calling out to God to preserve him because he takes his refuge in God. This opening prayer statement is as much a petition as it is a declaration of confidence. He is looking to God to watch over his life. And I'm sure that he is referring to both his physical and his spiritual life. This is certainly reinforced in verse 2. David addresses the Lord and says, You are my Lord. Now, that may not seem very revolutionary, but think about it in relation to all other authorities, all other kings and powers and objects of worship. David is saying, you are my Lord, not anything else. And he's looking to his Lord as his confidence over his entire life. When we think about this in terms of our relationship with Jesus, It is taking to heart Jesus' words in John 10, 28 to 29, when he says, I give them eternal life and they will never perish and no one will snatch them out of my hand. My father who has given them to me is greater than all and no one is able to snatch them out of the father's hand. When we know Jesus as our savior, he must be our Lord. To believe that Jesus can be your savior and not your Lord, is completely foreign to the scriptures. Jesus saves us and is our protector of our soul, our refuge from death and sin. We will not perish. We will not be lost. And no one can tear us from his gracious grip. When we think about this in terms of our physical life, we should have no less confidence. Because of Christ's constant care over our lives, we can echo the sentiments of Paul when he said in 2 Corinthians 1.10, He delivered us from such a deadly peril, and He'll deliver us. On Him we have set our hope that He will deliver us again. Notice David's statement in verse 2. I have no good apart from you. David is confessing that the fate of his life, his eternity, his years of life, every aspect of only good as he abides in God. His words are no different than the sentiments of James chapter 1, verse 17, where it says, every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. David believes James. Do we? Do we take the words of Christ when he says in John 10.10, I came that they may have life and have it abundantly and believe them? If we claim Christ as our Lord, this is what it means. It means not only that we say that my only good comes from Christ, but that we pursue this good. How often have we said that Jesus is Lord and yet we act as if everything else is our good? Do you know what that can mean? It can mean that our claims that Jesus is Lord is a lie at the worst and a deception of our hearts at the least. Verses 3 and 4 show us how this confession of confidence that we have, no good outside of God, is lived. You see, whatever we believe will be for our best. That is what we dedicate ourselves to. So what are you dedicating yourself to? What am I dedicating myself to? David showed that he was dedicated to God by loving what God loved and avoiding what stood against God. Verse 3 describes how David loved the saints in the land and he delighted in them. God had chosen Israel as his possession and he established an everlasting covenant with them. Jesus in 10.15 declares that the Father has given him a flock 
Much the same as what's declared by David here in this, in this psalm. And he goes on and he tells us that in order to bring them into his fold, he lays down his life for them. Jesus went to the cross. He was beaten, bloody, and slain for his sheep, his church. He died to redeem the people that he loved. Every Christian cannot claim to love Christ if he or she does not love what Christ loves. And Christ loves his church. To say that we do not value the church is to say that we do not value, as we should, Christ's sacrifice. To say that I can have an occasional relationship with the church is to have an occasional relationship with Christ. What this means for our confession of confidence in God is that we are declaring that as I look to have all my good come from God alone, my good would be found in the intimate fellowship with Christ's church. We are not seeking our good if we hardly associate with a a church body. Sometimes it is said that spending too much time worshiping with other believers, serving the church, giving our time and finances and energy to the church is unbalanced. I want to push back against this thought, though, for a moment. Can we honestly dedicate too much time to that which Christ loves? Would you say that spending too much time with your spouse is negative for your relationship? Would you say that you can spend too much time nurturing your relationship with your children? Here's the truth I want us to consider. When we do not make the life of the church one of our top priorities in our life, we are saying that we are not seeking our good. I'm kind of alarmed during these trying times how much I have heard about the hesitation of the people of God to regather. I want to say this graciously and and out of love and out of the desire for your good and with the truth that our good is, is when you and I delight in the fellowship of the church. I'm aware that there is always going to be valid circumstances that say uh, different things and, and say otherwise. But when staying home is because we treasure staying home because I can sleep in or stay in my pajamas, or we fear, or we value certain relationships, I'm deeply concerned. Christ laid down his life for his church, and we are hesitant to risk our comfort. We will not trust our fears to God. We do not value the family of God more for our joy. What is the true content of our confession? Verse 3 states the opposite of verse 2. David is saying that because God is his Lord and no good comes outside of him, seeking good among those who do not seek God is foolish. Anyone who seeks after other gods, and in our day that is basically all the worldly pursuits that takes God's place in our lives, they are pursuing their sorrow. Imagine any reasonable person saying, well, my greatest aim is to be miserable. No one would. But that is what happens outside of pursuing good without God. In 2 Corinthians 6, Paul asks some important questions that intersect with David's confession in verse 4. Paul asks, what partnership has righteousness with lawlessness? What fellowship has light with darkness? What accord has Christ with the devil? As As Paul continues, he is making this point. Believers should not partner with unbelievers. There should be very little that we have in common with them. Now, before someone says, but what about evangelism? Let me make this clear. Evangelizing the lost who need Jesus as their Savior is not contradicting what I've just said. Every Christian is to reach out to the lost with the gospel. But is that what we do most of the time? What we do many times is not befriend them for the gospel's sake, but we get into bed with them to join them in seeking our good. If we had real confidence that we had no good apart from Christ, we would dedicate our lives to seeking our joy with the saints rather than exploring the depths of our happiness with those who are actually hostile to God. We would come repeatedly to drink deeply from the well of the communion of the saints and we would venture into the raging murky waters of this world mainly to bring the truth of the gospel. Second, Our cause for confidence is found in verses 5 to 8. David has made his confession, and now he states why he has this confession. Verses 5 and 6 uses two different images to state why he has confidence in God for his good. First, in verse 5, he uses the idea of a portion of food. 
You can imagine a large buffet with all kinds of food and drink, but you can't have it all. You have to make a choice. You could have the lemon chicken, you could have the grilled peppercorn steak, you could have the maple salmon, but you have to choose. You can have a glass of water, maybe a soft drink, or a glass of Chardonnay, but you have to choose. And like most occasions, some things will satisfy while others do not. David says he has a portion, and he has a chosen portion. He has a chosen cup. And what is interesting is that many times we might think that when it comes to our relationship with God, our portion might be something from God. But that is not what David says. He says that the Lord is his food. The Lord is his drink. His blessing or lot is greater than some food or drink from the chef. But his joy is not the gift. His joy is in the giver. This thought is reinforced in verse 6 as David uses another image. Here he refers to the property lines that designate a portion of land that belongs to a person. In this case, it's referring to an inheritance received from a father. Once again, this is speaking of a portion, a gift, but much deeper than receiving a field. When we look at 2 Peter 1.3, we read that God has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness. And what is that? It is knowing Christ, or more accurately, it is having Christ. Jesus is our inheritance. Jesus is our field that we should sell everything to have. We have every reason to have confidence that our good is from the Lord because we are both God's possession and He is our possession. Jesus abides with us. We find life in Him. We share in His glory. We are partakers of the divine nature. This intimacy is a guarantee of our good. Verses 7 and 8 add more to this. David had cause for confidence because God has provided guidance and instruction. In verse 7, we are told that David finds that God provides counsel. In the moments of the night, he can pray and receive counsel from God. He can, in the daytime, open the scriptures and gain instruction. It is no different for us today. But as precious and valuable our prayer and the word, let us not forget that Christ is our teacher. Christ is instruction. Christ is our word. In Titus chapter 2, 11 to 14, we are told that the grace of God has appeared. And what is this grace that has appeared? It is Christ. Jesus is training us to renounce ungodliness and teaching us to live upright and godly. He is giving us hope as we wait for his appearing in glory. All because he gave himself for us to redeem us and make us his possession. The reason we can place our confidence in God is that the Lord is here. We are not forsaken. Jesus has made himself known to us, and we can know that there is nothing that can shake our confidence because he is always at our side. This reminds me of someone who is blind. One of the best ways for a blind person to get around is to place their hand on the shoulder of another as they place their trust in their guide. They choose a trusted guide who will lead them to that which is good. Jesus is our guide. He is not like guides of this world which are blind and would mislead us. As Hebrews 12, 2 states, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. We look to Jesus. We place our hand on his shoulder because he sees all things clearly. Jesus needs to be set before us in every moment. I need to look ahead and have my gaze set on Jesus. All that entices my eyes will only mislead me, only shake my faith. We should keep to heart that hymn, Be thou my vision, O Lord of my heart, not be all else to me, save that thou art. Thou my best thought by day or by night, waking or sleeping, thy presence my light. Third, our commitment for confidence is stated in verses 9 through 11. It is in these verses that David pronounces the direction of his life and his heart. There's something about a a public pronouncement that brings with it assurance and even accountability. I have had at times when I was wanting to be very intentional 
I declared something that I was going to do so that I could not back out of it. I needed the accountability that came with announcing my desire and my intention. For David, this is more than just what he wants to do, but he's also stating something that he truly believes. He understands that if God is his Lord and every good comes from him, if he truly understands that his good finds its cause in God, he must back it up with commitment. Look at what he says. My heart is glad. I rejoice in my every part, and I am secure because his God will never abandon his soul. Sheol, or death, will not be able to end his life. He will not face the decomposition of his spirit. All these things are his assurance. Remember that David makes this commitment because of what we read before this. He has experienced the good that comes from God. He has witnessed the delight of God's people. He has eaten and drank from God. He has glimpsed his inheritance. He has enjoyed God's guidance. He has been led through the darkness into the light as God is set before him. It reminds me of Paul's desire explained in Philippians 1, 23 to 26, particularly in terms of how David talks about death. Paul explains that he is torn because he desires to be with Christ, but he also knows that God's plan is for him to stay for the joy of the church and the glory of Christ. You know what Paul's greater desire meant? Paul would have preferred to die. You see, David and Paul had no fear of death. They understood that death's sting was no more. What could death really do? Bring them into the presence of Christ? Death would usher them into their greatest joy. It would transport them to their glory. Why do we fear death? Are we not confident that we are truly saved? Are we scared of the pain that death might bring? Are we concerned for the living? To the first, we need to confess our sins. If you doubt your salvation, confess your sins, believe in Jesus, and then you no longer have to fear death. To the second, this momentary suffering is nothing compared to the glory of Christ that awaits us. If pain is the necessary path to being in the presence of Christ, may it come quickly and now. To the third, I think we should heed the words of Christ from Matthew chapter 8, verse 22. Follow Jesus wherever he leads and let the dead bury their own dead. Our greater concern is not the living, but following Christ. If we are followers of Christ, if he is our confidence, we can declare that he is our life. Our lives are hidden in him. This life, what awaits us beyond the grave, should find us transfixed on the magnificence of what lies ahead. 1 John 3, 2 gives us, every reason to declare our commitment of confidence. It says that when Christ appears, when we see him again, we will see him as he is. That is, we will see him in his radiant glory. What we will see is the brilliant light of his mercy, of his love, of his grace. And do you know what else we will see? We will see ourselves transformed with his glory. All the earthly burdens, all the tyranny of sin, all the hindrances to embrace his joy are going to be gone. We will be bathed in love, in grace, and in mercy. It's it's completely overwhelming to imagine and practically impossible to capture in words. Verse 11 continues this commitment to confidence in God alone. But it also seems to punctuate the entire psalm. David declares this truth. God reveals the road that leads to life, a life in the presence of God. It is in the presence of God that joy is full and complete. Being beside God are pleasures every day, forever. David's declaration foreshadows a number of truths that point us to Christ. The path of life uh, takes us to John chapter 14, verse 6, where Jesus states that he is the way, the truth, and the life. This path that David talks about is Jesus. He is the life, and it is God who reveals this to us. I would have never discovered the right path without God. Like trying to find an unmarked trail in the middle of thousands of acres of forest, the path of Christ is revealed only by the map of God's grace. 
2 Timothy 1, 9 and 10 explain that it is not our own path. It's not our works that we do, but His illuminating grace that comes from Christ that reveals the gospel of truth. Our fullness of joy and pleasures, whether in this life or eternity, are linked to Jesus. Notice that this joy is not found if we are not present with Him. If we are seeking life without Him, there is no joy. We see this illustrated wonderfully when Jesus fed the crowds. Now, it's wonderful that Jesus cared for the hungry stomachs of the crowds, but His point was really not His care for the hungry. It is an illustration of our great need. The crowds did not have food. They did not have the means to attain it. Just as our joy cannot be found, we do not find it. But Jesus does what the crowds and the disciples could not do. He provides food for them to feast upon. It's also an illustration of Christ's abundant, joyous provision. His joys, his pleasures were so great that everyone ate as much as they wanted, and yet more remained. Are you able to declare this commitment to find your confidence in Christ? Even if you are unable to do so perfectly or even consistently, is your greatest desire to live this out so that in Christ you find the fullness of joy and that at His right hand are your greatest pleasures forevermore? Do you know when I struggle with thinking this or saying it or even believing it? It starts when I believe the lie that Satan, this world, and my heart speak to me. The greatest concern is when I find myself actually wanting to hear it. Like all of us, I ache in my bones. My heart beats for pleasure, for satisfaction, and for joy. It drives my thinking. It shapes my desires. It guides my decisions. It directs my hands and my feet. I am driven for my joy. And when my fallen nature gets into dead decaying hands. It gets its dead decaying hands around my joy. It points me away from Christ and I fall into sin. Lust consumes my heart. Discontentment fills my desire. Ambition turns from Christ to my wants. As I have looked down into the lust, the discontentment, and the unholy ambitions, they look often like pleasant meadows and sunny warm days. But when I step into them, I fall into a pit. And at the bottom of this abyss, I wallow in the putrid waters that move with the corpses of rot. Once again, I am surrounded with my sin, my lust, my discontentment, my ambition, and it is unsatisfying and ugly. Time and time again, I have wept over falling once again. But time and time again, I have been met in due course, not by the condemnation of Christ, but the grace of his sacrifice. Tears of fear and despondency are turned to tears of repentance and hope because Christ has not abandoned my soul to death. In the pit, I look up and Jesus is standing with his hand outstretched. And every time, I am completely unable to reach up to him, but he takes hold of me and pulls me from my mess. He clothes me in garments washed white by his blood and restores to me the joy of my salvation. For reasons I don't fully understand, Christ makes known to me the paths of life, and I am again invited to pursue a life that has no good apart from him. Where are you in your relationship with Christ? Maybe you need to start right at the beginning with deciding if you really want Christ to be your Lord. Perhaps you need to take a hard look at your heart and see if you really believe that you have no good apart from Jesus. You might want to examine your commitment by your association with the church and willingness to determine if you have been joining those who are running after their own gods. Are you taking counsel from God in regular prayer? Are you opening your Bible for Christ's guidance? Is your commitment true? Do you believe that your life is in God's hands or do you want to control it? Do you know the path of life? Do you walk in Christ's presence? Is Jesus at your right hand? Sometimes confidence, when it is expressed, can be understood as pride, sometimes even arrogance. A person can appear to know what they want. They can appear to know what they know. And yet they have no security. Much of my life, I've displayed confidence in what I believe, how I should act, and and what I should say. I have been told, 
quite honestly, at times that I was arrogant, and perhaps often it was true. But in reality, much of it was because at my core, I am an insecure person. But as I mature spiritually, I'm growing less insecure and more confident. And what I certainly hope is that what would be true and that people would see is not self-confidence. They wouldn't see arrogance, but they would see that I lean on Christ. My desire is that I would find confidence in Christ alone. Perhaps you are the person who's quite different. You struggle with assurance. Your confidence is torn from you easily, and you just can't seem to cling confidently to Christ. No one thinks you're arrogant. They see you as timid. They see you as indecisive. I would encourage you to look at Christ as your unmoving rock and to anchor your soul to him. Our God is unchanging. He says that you do not look to yourself, but to God to know that you have life, that you can find joy, and that you are of great worth. In a moment, we are going to sing these words. My heart is glad, and with all I rejoice. With all abandoned in praise, lift my voice. I dwell secure, for you hold my flesh. You won't abandon my soul down to death, not to corruption but brought into life, you let not your Holy One face endless strife. Lord, in your presence is joys evermore, the fullness of pleasure for those who are yours. May this be our confidence. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we come before you as people that can quite often seek our joys in very wrong places. We can display a sense of confidence and self-assurance that really is misplaced and really is veiling a number of things, our pride, our sin, our insecurities, our lack of trust in all things. And yet we cling to all kinds of things. We pursue all kinds of things and all because we're trying to find our satisfaction and our joy. And in this world, we are met with all kinds of options. We are met with all kinds of things that would that would lure us away from your presence. There is all kinds of offerings that we can we can give to to unseen gods and idols in our life. And yet, all of them lead us to a pit, to a place of despair where there is no hope. I would pray, Lord, that each one of us would turn to you, that we would declare with all the grace that you can give, that you are our Lord, that there is no good outside of you, that we will find our joy in what brings you pleasure, in the fellowship of the saints, that we will find our good in pursuing you and not what leads us away from you, the idols of this world and the the, the views of this society, of this culture, Lord, help us. Help us to turn to you, to pray to you, to entrust ourselves to you, to to embrace the truths of the word of God and to know with confidence because of what you have provided, because you are our inheritance, that you are our portion forevermore, that in you there are joys forevermore. We do not fear death. We do not fear the sword. We do not We do not fear the criticism of others. What we do is we fear you. And in your presence, even though you are a great and wonderful God who is full of power and might, that you are also good. As C.S. Lewis has said, you are not safe, but you are good. And may we abide in you. Help us, Lord, to turn off all those things and turn away from all those things that promise our good but do not deliver. May we turn to you for our joys forevermore. I pray for each one today that you would guide them and you give them your hope. I pray, Lord, that you would convict them, convict me in my heart to pursue only you. We pray these things in the name of Jesus. 
who gave his life for us so that we could have the abundant life that he promised as his children, as heirs of your promise. I pray in his name. Amen.